Hey guys, what's up? Eddie Aho here with KissAnalog.com. Today what I want to do is I want to talk about uh, the Active Clamp 4 converter and how we're going to choose the chip, but also uh, kind of show you what the chips look like. We're going to look at a couple of them, okay? I'm going to bring you to the data sheets and kind of talk to you about what, uh, you know, here's what I think I'm going to do. I've had a few people uh, comment on about how they like to see the thought process or or the process and how you approach a design or how you select parts. So I think what I'm going to do is kind of do it that way. Show you the parts, kind of show you the circuit and why I like what I do and, um, you know, kind of approach it that way. So, and by the way, I've got this project I'm putting in a box. I just did a review on this just recently. It's Class D Amplifier Switching Power Supply. Got a box for it. Got a VU display, really nice. Excited about getting that project going. Um, or get it in a box so I can actually, you know, <laughs> pass off to a friend and see what he thinks. Anyway, then I've got a couple other eval cards that I want to show you guys. This one here, this is a PFC, and it's an interesting one. It's by Texas Instruments, and it's actually two uh, PFC chokes working together. So they're smaller, and yeah, there's some advantages to that. So I'm going to show you this, and then I also want to do a video on this one. This is a really cool board. This is an active clamp flyback, not a Ford. Um, yeah, the active clamp flyback. Pretty interesting design concept. But this board is really cool because not only does it have the active clamp flyback, but it has the normal flyback. So the hard switcher, they call it. Uh, so we get to compare both of them, look at the waveforms and that. So this would be really educational, I think. Um, I might skip this one ahead of everything else, just do a quick video on this. And probably follow up and do a couple videos on this one. Because, yeah, there's a lot to learn on that. And... Yeah, really cool eval card. So thank you, Texas Instruments. I've had these for a while. They gave them to me uh, when I was evaluating another design. And then, yeah, so I just have them around for that. So I just found them in a box when I was going through trying to organize my lab. <laughs> so got so, I got lots of stuff to show you guys. Uh, I got this Genrad oscillator that I'm looking at over here that I'm really excited about trying and I've got another HP over here somewhere. I got a lot of stuff to show you guys. And But hey, for now, let's talk about the Active Clamp Ford. Now, when I started design, any design, and even if I've done it multiple times, like I've done a bunch of Active Clamp Ford converter designs. And they've all, you know, I think, I was going to say they're all been successful designs. I've had, I've only ever had a couple of designs that have been struggles you know to try to get them to work and uh they've been based around llc converters so if any of you guys try that you might understand that but on active clamp four converters or four converters or flyback converters generally they work the first time first board don't even have to make a board change kind of had a reputation for that different companies i've worked and uh it's not because I'm a G Wiz engineer. Well, maybe it is. <laughs> no, it's because uh, I think it's because of the way I approach it. So I think that's why I want to share. Uh, some people just choose a chip. Maybe they've seen it on a board. Maybe they've you know tried to reverse engineer another board and they thought, God, I want to use that chip. I've seen it a few times show up. So they just choose that chip. Not based on anything like a trade study comparing how different chips work. Not even going into that kind of detail, just something they've seen around and they just want to try it. So some people approach it that way. And some people will look to see what someone else has used and go, hey, I'm going to use that chip because that guy made that chip work, so I want to use that. That's a common method of choosing a control chip. Uh, the way I usually go about it with every design is I've had like I say a lot of these designs and I've used a lot of different control chips not that I wasn't happy with the one before but uh, that I wanted to try something new uh, and honestly that's probably why <laughs> but also that I uh, did a trade study 
kind of looked at them because that's part of my process is every time I do a new design I like to see I like to look at the field and see what's out there and you know see what's new and um, it's a way to kind of keep your designs fresh um, active clamp four converters came out they they got a big foothold and everybody started making those chips so you want to see is this chip just a I can do it too kind of chip and it's maybe not even as good as one they're copying or they're trying to emulate or is it a better one like hey we've learned stuff since the decade that we started doing these these chips are better because of these reasons and sometimes those reasons get lost between the people who uh, at the company might say hey I want to do this chip because of this and they talk their management in, into doing that and that and that thought or um, those ideas are lost between that guy and that team and the marketing people and applications engineers <laughs> I've seen that many times some very good application engineers they just don't understand why like an active clamp converter for a long time I was well I was never told why they're better I, I figured that on my own like as I mentioned once before just doing simulations I'm like holy crap these are cool I got an eval card from a vendor I think it was TI and I was blown away I was like man okay I'm gonna switch from a reset winding to active clamp and I haven't looked back because there's no reason to uh, some people say hey well why don't you use a two switch well why <laughs> Um, now someone, one of, the, one of the guys here commented, and I'd like to hear more about it, i got to respond to him. I, I read a lot of comments and sometimes I don't have to time to answer them all. So, but I do kind of peruse them. I can read pretty quick. It takes me longer to actually respond to everybody's messages, especially when I get questions and things like that. So, sorry about that. I, I'm still working through them and sometimes I'll answer them really late, but I try. Anyway, someone responded and said, the uh, two switch forwards are great for space applications. Well, when I did space applications, that wasn't a thing. I and and the uh, the reason why this was stated was because of single and um, single event failures. Now that's when you get this particle that just shoots right through your metal box and everything hits your fat and kills it. Well, it doesn't really kill it; it disrupts it. Single event failure or event uh, is usually this particle that's shooting through space and it just goes right through everything it's going I don't know 86,000 miles an hour or something like that I don't know they're going super fast uh, speed of light <laughs> and they just go through things there's maybe they're so teeny but you know it's speed and mass right it's those two things combined if you have something super heavy going super slow it's hard to stop right something going super fast super small is very hard to stop too maybe both of them on the extremes are impossible to stop so they go through fets well as it turns out and I like to hear more about this because hey I you know I've got some expertise but I don't ever say that I'm the expert on everything and that's why I review the market when I'm looking at active clamp chips again I want to see what everybody else is doing and I want to see if I can learn from other people. So, uh, so let me know on this space thing, you know, because I'm really interested. When I an 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 when I analyze it one time, what it was is the event it disrupts the fat, and the time frame that it disrupts the fat is less than a a switching cycle. So it's like, oh, I get an extra pulse in there, big deal. So, what it'll do is it'll make the fat like turn on. But it turns it on for, like I say, less than a switching cycle. So it's not a big deal. The single event thing can cause some major disruptions if your circuit can't respond or can't deal with that kind of, you know, on cycle. Now, the thing that's uh, disruptive is is when it's been in like deep space for a long period of time, getting bombarded constantly. That kind of stuff's bad. Two switch forward, I don't see how, now maybe only one FET gets hit and the other FET doesn't, so you don't have that cycle, but a switching cycle, it's it's not a big deal, I don't think. So anyway, the ones I've done for satellites and that have been single switch forward converters. And, and from what I've seen from other applications, 
they're all kind of based on that. And another thing about that is uh, in space, typically the power system is going to be 30 volt DC system, okay? Plus minus, forget what it is, 6 volts or something like that. But anyway, so choosing a FET that has a voltage rating isn't difficult. Now, when you're choosing things that's going to, uh, you know, be in lower orbit, less of a deal. In higher orbit, you know, deep space, bigger deal. Uh, single event, definitely it's something to worry about or be concerned or do the analysis on. Uh, but I did something for, you know, so it was a system that was used in the, uh, military where the president would want to have communications and he wouldn't want to lose that and so you know large EMP event you had to worry about these single event failures like it used in space and so yeah anyway so I've done you know some airborne ground based and space born and um, if if someone you're working for and you're doing a space product and they want to do a two switch well then do a two switch now you have two parts that can fail so the reliability just you know took a hit so that's one thing you got to think about as well so and the voltage level like I say in a lot of space systems isn't there the one I worked on for the International Space Station was uh, I think it was 125 volts or something like that 100 amp power supply uh, they're known as six kilowatt power supplies or something like that, but they're actually capable of at least 10 kilowatts so uh, very powerful and it is a completely different design and uh, Anyway, so and they've been up in space for a long time to change out one of those power supplies in space I'm going to show a video I think if you guys are interested in seeing that because it's really interesting how they did that but videos get kind of long so let me just kind of Go through this so what I do is I do these what I call trade studies you compare this you compare two things and you know you see what the pros and cons are that's a trade study okay <clears throat> all right so what I do is and you know as far as choosing a new control chip the one time I switched control chip um, what I actually did was I had this uh, application that had a very sensitive oscillator okay it was like 10 megahertz but it was a system oscillator very sensitive and when you look at its requirements it says hey power supply noise has to be below 40 or 50 db something like that and typically you know I, I want to say the average power supply is is that it's good for that uh, but it wasn't good enough for this oscillator it would there, what would happen is you warmed up or cooled down the power supply the there'd be this little spike that would drift across 10 megahertz and upset the clock and I was like wow that's crazy that taught me two things uh, one thing is I was always very careful not to switch at 100 kilohertz like a even harmonic of say 10 megahertz or if I knew what the frequency was of other clocks which if you work for a really good system engineer he'll tell you the clock frequencies that are being used so you can make sure that you know you don't upset those frequencies and so I would one of the things I would do is I would choose 120 kilohertz switching or 200 kilohertz or like 220 kilohertz not 200 you know didn't want to be an even multiple an even harmonic you know of a 10 meg clock because that's a common one or a 20 meg clock or something like a 100 meg clock you know that kind of thing so but what I learned was that even though if I was switching at say 150 kilohertz if you multiply that so many times you're gonna get a harmonic at 10 meg because <laughs> yeah it just it just seems like that's gonna be the case and even if it doesn't hit it right on like in this case where the temperature changes the oscillator just slightly it'll drift across that once you multiplied your switching frequency enough times to uh, be up in that megahertz range 10 megahertz or higher range uh, it's you know it's it's difficult to avoid that one of the ways you can do it another way besides choosing that fre switching frequency is choosing an oscillator that has less drift and so and also uh, feedback systems and that that have less um, common mode noise issues they have more 
um, isolation from common mode noise. Anyway, so this control chip had that. And then later on, I, I used an analog devices feedback chip that gave me a lot more isolation between common mode noise. So that may have helped too. But, um, but so you just make improvements like that as you go on. And sometimes people are afraid to change control chips because they're like, hey, that worked. But there are some control chips that have extra dials, extra knobs to set, like on these LLC converters, for instance, that sometimes they can make it more difficult to get one to work easy, you know. And so back to, you know, my process. So I, I like to do a trade study. I like to look at capacitors, you know, re, even sense resistors, just different things, just to see, hey, if there's something new. Not only that, to update the parts list occasionally, with a few more parts with each design. So you're always got an updated parts list. So you don't end up with this parts list that's just got a bunch of old parts, and then you want to add a whole bunch of new parts for some new design. You know, you just upgrade your parts list here and there, right? All right, so... The next thing is look at your control chips, your options. Part of that trade study is looking to see how many evaluation card, eval cards that are actually made off of that control chip. If there's only a single one, maybe two, it's not going to give you a lot of uh, comparisons between, let's say they offer a spreadsheet you can fill out or you can design to, and then... Often what I found is when you go look at the actual evaluation card, you'll see like say, a filter or something like that that's added to each one of those cards that's not shown in the application note or even or especially the data sheet. But you're like, ah, for those guys to get that to work, they found that adding this uh, capacitor, this RC filter, was was a trick. And so what's awesome, say someone like TI, they have multiple evaluation cards. And not only that, reference designs, just paper designs. And you're like, well, some of those, they'll show a board. So they actually build a board to prove out their design. They may not offer it, but at least you get to see that, hey, they actually built something. Oh, and look, there's that RC filter. So when you choose a control chip, that there's only say one eval card made on and when you go to look at their help center and things like that there's very little information about it that's usually one I like to stay away from uh, I like to go with you know chips like in that have multiple examples of okay or that they've written white papers on to explain well the advantages of an active clamp and here's this chip that we make and here's Here's how we built the circuit to prove out the efficiencies and blah, 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 and all that stuff. But then you're like, oh, but look at that. They never even really talk about that capacitor right there, but there it is. Or it's totally different value than what's shown in the data sheet. And you're like, huh, they said 100 picofarad, but they got 1,000 picofarad on all these designs. Another thing is when you see one design at 100 watts, 500 watts, 1,000 watts, it gives you different power levels so you can see the trade-offs they made in components, filtering, that kind of thing to get those different power levels to work. And along with that, the spreadsheet that you design to, you can go, hmm, okay, my, my design's coming out this way and I kind of see how it falls into this, so it looks like I'm good. Or you're like, wow, okay, but I don't have that capacitor or or that capacitor, it just said, do not place over here. They didn't even give it value. They just showed a capacitor on the thing, and they don't even talk to it. And you're like, oh, come on, guys. Like, mention why you put that cap there, or show an example value of that capacitor. Just don't put, you know, do not place, like, DNP next to it, you know, not installed or something like that next to it. That, that's, that just raises questions. It's like, okay, what the heck's going on here? So, all right, guys. Um. Another thing is to look at chips, like I looked at the, date, the data sheet to see when it was last updated. If it's been a long time, like a decade, then that kind of gives me a little squirming feeling too. On the other hand, it could give you confidence, like, hey, this chip's solid. You know, it's been solid for, for years. So it's just a marker. It's just something to look at to, to kind of, you know, 
level off with all your other things you're looking at and and just kind of take that data in and see what you think about it um, if you see not for new design and there's a series of those chips and you're like oh man what well, you know ask like why is this one not for sometimes you know I don't I feel like sometimes you don't get the straight answer maybe the app guy doesn't really know so he's just kind of guessing or given the company line or something like that so go online and ask try that too you know or maybe just stay away from that series <laughs> i i find that once one one part in the series starts getting replaced or not for new designs it it that's just the beginning of the wave um but not necessarily true just another marker so anyway just a lot of talk about kind of things i think about when i'm starting the design look at the new mosfets that's a big one there's always a new generation of mosfets every couple of years it seems like at least you know like you know some of these generations are gener like ganfets they're generation three or five now uh, some of these chips control chips same thing they show the generations so i like to choose a newer generation now if the newer generation just offers different features from the older generation and they look like they're they're not replacing one another they look like they're you know it's just a trade-off like oh i want this instead of this then that's something maybe don't worry about but if you see like your chip that you're using they've indexed the part number by one you're like okay and the other day sheet really hasn't been updated you're like okay this one's going to be the new chip maybe they don't want to tell you yet because they still want to sell all that stock that they have in distribution or whatever you know sometimes they keep on making a, a chip part for a certain period of time because they have big uh customers you know they're buying lots of them so they've given them you know usually a year you know usually you get about a year uh time frame to change out your design or to buy a bunch of stock and so usually they give you about a year notice that this part's going to be no longer available so all right let's go take a quick look at the data sheets we'll come back and say hi <laughs> all right thanks guys all right guys so i'd like to start off the data sheet and all right guys generally i'll go to companies i know renaissance uh, bought Intercell, that's why the I and ISL, that's where that came from, Intercell, which used to be Harris back in the day. Uh, very well respected company, so there you go. I'm going to zoom in on this. So we have this data sheet, and I go to somewhere like Renaissance, and I'll look up there for their control chips for active clamp 4 converters. I'll go to TI, National Semiconductor on semi you know people like that to find out where i can find control chips and and then i can even go to mauser and do a search or just google for active clamp you know for converter control chips uh or controllers and i'll get something like this so all right so here's one and it gives examples the applications where they put on you know if you don't see your application there doesn't mean you can't use it of course that's just you know this is marketing information but it does have a lot of technical stuff in but it doesn't you know so anyway just want to say that now one thing i want to point out right here supports n and p channel active clamp fets okay that's really important uh programmable slope compensation so some really cool features in this they're really useful Okay, uh, there's an enable pin if you need that. All right, so let's go ahead and look at some of the examples. Now, obviously these are simple. Obviously these are simplified, but it's great because it makes it easy to kind of see the main, you know, pieces of this. And what we have is our output M, out M for main controller or main switching FET. Okay, so what we have is out M for our main um, switching fat. Okay, and then we have this one, the red or the blue, and or P channel active clamp. So for lower voltages, uh, this one is super easy. For higher voltages, it's nice that they have this ability 
these signals out AC are not, they do not look the same, okay? So you can't just use any controller and put a level shift and do this. So that, that's an important thing to look at. And then they show an asymmetrical half bridge, but yeah, just another you know, twist on things if you want to use something like that. But here's the place where they give a description of each pin. It's really good to read this. Take note about uh, the voltage levels, the, um, if they say to use a certain capacitor, resistor value, sometimes they give that kind of information in these things. So, um, you know, they're talking about the charge current for the slope. So, and here, VREF, you know, with a 0.1 and a 2 point, or so, for instance, VREF, they're saying bypass to ground with a 0.1 to 2.2 low ESR cap. And VREF can source up to 10 milliamps. Generally, it's not good to run other chips with these references. They're mainly used to set up. I mean, you don't want to use all 10 milliamps or close to it. You know, so uh, I, I just recommend being careful doing that. Sometimes people want to be cheaper you know they just want to use everything they can but uh sometimes i've seen these things go wrong all right so then down here they show you uh you know part numbers and how to order it and so on but it gives you the temperature range of this part so if you need minus 55 you know this may or may not work doesn't mean it will not work but you know, if it's going to damage your part, that's one thing. If it's just going to lose some tolerances, that's another. But it'll go up to 105. That's good. Now, one thing about inner sills block diagrams on these chips is kind of hard to read, right? Right in the middle, there's all this empty space. And then these big block over here with small text in them. And then you know, different size of text. It's, it's like, wow, who, who did this? Uh, they had an intern or something and no one reviewed it or it looked good on a big screen. And they're like, yeah, check, check that off. That's good. But I mean, then you have these parts down here that are very important, all this stuff on the pins and it's so small that it's kind of, you know, you have to zoom in. It's just a hard block diagram to really read. And there's also a little bit of information I wish they would have added, which you know is generally the case. I always wish they would add more information. <laughs> so here is the uh, a typical schematic, you know, and on something like this, they are trying to show you, you know, most of the resistors, capacitors, pretty much everything they think you're going to need to make this run. And so this is, you know, typical application. So you have your control chip and it's running your two FETs right here, okay? Now this thing right up here, this T2, this transformer that has one turn on one side and several turns on the other, that, that's true. That's a typical sign for say a current sense where your conductor goes through a transformer that has multiple turns so you can pick up a small signal and read it back for your current sense so it's running right over here and down here into your current sense right in here okay you got your transform your isolation and then all your stuff on this side okay so you can see they're using a p channel here for q2 so it's low side it's connected to this side of the transistor and bring it down here okay so then um on the secondary side you got your output inductor your lc filter and you got your synchronous uh fetch your transistors for your uh, to replace the diodes and see this winding right here this is a way to self-power your your gate to source to turn it on okay just using some windings to create your own voltage that's generally good if the if the voltage from across your output is too high to put on your gate, then this is a good way to do that. Now, there are some disadvantages of, of self-powering your gate drive like this. 
Now, see this one, this gate right here is being driven. It's not being driven by, it's not being self-powered, self-driven, okay? The signal is actually coming through this transformer right here that's coupled into your out AC, okay? Uh, but what you could have done is out M could have came over and drove this other transistor, you know, the synchronous FET. So uh, that's just the way they chose to do this one. And then down here you have your optocoupler to, you know, kind of transfer your voltage reading over here, your reference voltage, and to drive the feedback pin to keep your output regulated. Okay, so that's your circuit. And then here's a here's the same thing that maybe what they should have done is show this one first because it looks simpler, right? You have diode rectification instead of the transistors. So this one simplifies the schematic maybe a little easier to see might have been smart to put show that one first and then and then you scroll down and see this one so you don't get scared right out of the gate <laughs> all right so here's your absolute maximum ratings okay this is a good thing to look at and make sure things are going to operate within what you think they're going to be okay all right and then uh your specs okay so it's always, I'm just going to race through this. We don't want to spend too much time looking at this right now. But down here, functional description, they'll talk about how the circuit works. Okay. It's kind of typical of a data sheet. First, they show you some specs, then talk about how it works. There's some waveforms showing you what out M and out AC look like. And that's for the P channel. Then down here, they uh, show you the same waveforms for the N channel. Down here, they show you the similar waveforms for the N channel, okay? So they are different. And this table right here is very important to understand. We'll talk about that later, okay? I'm just trying to show you kind of things that you look for. Uh, average current configuration. This has this interesting current control, okay? Um, so it's one of those features that not every chip's going to have this one. It's a little different in how it operates. So it's good to read into this stuff. And this one right here is showing you if you do want more power, you want to synchronize two chips, then you can do it this way. So now it looks like to the output, it looks like you have twice the frequency. And also to the input, by the way, you're not yanking current all at the same time you're yanking current at a higher frequency too so that's nice okay then there's a slope compensation thing they were talking about up above another thing that's going to be different with this chip than others okay and then ground plane uh requirements you want to read and understand this important when you start doing your layout Okay, then here's some uh, revision history and, you know, so good to look into this stuff too. Okay, so that's, that's a data sheet. Now let's, now let's go through and look at this application note. Here, let me open this up a little bit. Look, this, this was uh, made back when it was called Intercell. So there you go. Um, here's some um, specs of this design it's 90 watt switching 160 kilohertz inputs 18 to 36 outputs 12 volts so if you have a similar design slightly different you can see how yours changes from this one or how similar it is depending on which case is so it gives you something to think about and here's the uh the evaluation board boy those photographs aren't super great i think i have one of these cards uh, I think I've had it around for you for a while. So I'll see if I, I may have shown it on the channel. I'm not sure. I can't remember. If not, I'll pull it out and show it to you. Okay, waveforms and stuff like that. So this is great. When, this is what I'm talking about. This is awesome to uh, see how somebody else's circuit works. And so you can, um, you know, have a better understanding and know what to look for. And then I look at the schematic too. Now, 
Let me break the schematic up so it doesn't look so busy. The top is your input LC filter. No big deal. So it comes right to your winding of your, your main winding. Okay, main primary winding. Then out of the primary winding comes over here and goes to this thing. So you have this little transformer here that's a, a current sense. They showed a bunch of windings on this, but I doubt it's probably one winding on this, on this side between pins seven and eight. And you can see the output of that goes through this filter. Here's your R and your C coming into your current sense pin. Okay, so that's your uh, current sense. And following that down, you see your main switching transistor. Okay, so this P13, this is going to come from your main, your out M right there. Okay, so that's the drive for that. It's just so crowded here. But over here, you have your capacitor off that same node coming through a P channel FET to ground. So it's low side uh, clamp, okay? Then through your capacitor into your out AC, okay? We're gonna talk about a lot of this circuit and how it works, even if we don't use this chip, we'll talk about it because the chip we use will probably be very similar. Now, this is an interesting thing here we wanna pay attention to. See this BDD? This circuit right here is what we call a kickstart. So the VN comes in and goes to this transistor to the output. This transistor is regulated um, with the zener down here to give you a regulated voltage. Now, I, th I feel like a better way to do this is with the NPN transistor, uh, but it's easier to control the voltage. But anyway, um, so you have a kickstart circuit that provides VDD, okay? Now we come down here and here's VDD right here with this 2.2 mic cap. It's kind of busy, but there's where that is. Now let me show you something else. Up here, the transformer, you come down, you see this other little winding. Now we have two diodes and LC filter and VDD. So this is your bootstrap. That was your kickstart. That's to get the circuit running over here on the left. And then this guy up here is the VDD, this this one's meant to take over and let the transformer power the chip so it self-powers itself to run, okay? Doesn't mean it's free energy. The energy is still being taken off the input power, but it's just more efficient. It's a switching input versus a linear over here, okay? So that kind of covers most of the important stuff from this transformer to the left. That's the primary side of the circuit. On the secondary side, the top winding, we have some diodes, LC filter, and an output, 5.7 volts it says. Okay, great. And then we have another winding, and then we go through these synchronous FETs. So that tells us, oh, this is where the power is gonna be. Now we see these parallel diodes. Well, this configuration, I'll talk about this in another video. This is kind of an interesting, deal but anyway then you come off of 12 volts and this is your power output so you can see how you can have more than one output and even though this bootstrap over here on the bottom left is now put it's on the primary side the ground symbols on this side because each one of these windings is isolated until you reference it to something so this is all primary side over here they're showing the earth ground symbol, which is completely wrong to do, obviously. It just looks ridiculous. But anyway, it's just sad how things have gotten. They have symbols for a reason, and they mean something. It's too bad that people don't know that. Anyway, so now down here in the middle, we see these transformers, okay? And if you follow this back, this comes back from the out AC and out M. So this is what I was talking about. You really want to sync your output FETs with your input FETs. And you go through these drive transformers and you drive these transistors, okay? And these drive the FETs. So now the FETs, instead of being driven off of the output windings, which, you know, a normal forward converter, you lose pretty much nothing by doing that. But in an active clamp, it's all about the timing, turning things on and off at the right time. So powering them off of this out M, out AC is a great way to 
improve your efficiency on the output. Okay, and then you have your optocoupler again with your voltage feedback network over here. And it's just driving this opto to keep this thing regulated. And that was interesting how they drew, drew a line right through the chip. That's a total no-no, guys. Uh, there are a lot of no-nos on this schematic. Somebody, they just wanted to cram everything on one page. You know, they could have shown all the primary stuff on one page and all the secondary stuff on another and had a nice clean schematic instead of looking like they don't know what they're doing. That's just sad. But anyway, that's the way things are going these days. Uh, companies don't want to hire full engineers to do this kind of stuff and they get interns and people don't want to keep on changing their work so they just let things slide. And so you end up with, you know, the lost art of electronics. Anyway, here's the board layouts I've been kind of going through. Example board layouts, really good to follow. Now, guys, just because these are the so-called experts and they design the chip doesn't mean their board layouts are the best either. But a lot of times you can learn things from them, but you can also learn what not to do. <laughs> I'll point some of that stuff out at another time, okay? But yeah, there's, I can just see by screening over this, there's some glaring issues. But, all right, well, so that's an Interso chip, okay? All right, guys, here's one from Texas Instruments, okay? Um, and by the way, Interso, I mean, there's some more examples. I, I just uh, showing you one of each one, just kind of show you. But again, I like to look for multiple uh, examples from each chip. Now, here's a bunch of information, these features. A lot of times I'll point out the important stuff what they think is important like true drive two amp sync and source output so you sounds like you drive a pretty good size of fat with that right so um i've used this chip i like it works great I use both of these chips and they both work great but yeah so here's this one you can kind of see it's a low side drive okay and we have our synchronous drive over here so, all right, let's just scroll on down. And here's pinouts, different kinds of chips, you know, if you want to get. Uh, here's a TSOP 20 pin and a QFN 20 pin. So, there's a couple different sizes or styles of chips there for you. Uh, now, here again, it, you know, talks about each pin what it does the function and ti does a good job as well absolute maximum ratings there's where you compare temperatures and different things voltage levels see if it's going to work for you and then the recommended operating conditions okay i'm just going to scroll through this kind of like i did before just kind of scroll on down oh here here's block diagram TI's block diagrams are are better than that inner sills block diagram, right? That's much easier to read and see what's going on. So, yeah, a lot easier. And they have, you know, start and some time stuff in there, some voltage levels for the references um, for, for this chip. So these op amps, you can see what your signal is being referenced to. So... Yeah, that's a very usable block diagram. Okay, and then here's, they get right into feature description with design, like showing you the equations, like here, let's design one. Uh, good information about grounds right here. That's always good to read about. And JFET control, so high impedance input is what that's telling you. But here's some wiring or some timing diagrams, very useful information. More timing diagrams. It's good to understand this stuff. So just kind of going through, just kind of showing you the kind of information. You can see how detailed this uh, data sheet is. 
here's that bootstrap winding I was talking about, you know, talking about how to use uh, power to power up your uh, device. Now they don't show the kickstart in here. They're just showing the bootstrap, but generally you'd have a diode coming in from a kickstart and you diode or the voltage like we saw before. Okay. Um, here we go. Bootstrap bias from your output winding. If you don't want to put that on your transformer for some reason, you can come from your secondary side. You just have to remember this is going to be referenced to your primary ground, so you got to keep isolation from from this side all the way over here. So, but yeah, another way to do it. Okay, nice. Uh, here's a nice diagram. This is going to be useful. Here's a very, very simplified typical application. How do you like the way they put the block diag or the power stage all in this one little block? They're just showing stuff that's going on around the control chip itself. So here's an example. And, you know, they're going to go through all these steps to show you how to do some math. another you know block diagram this is still kind of block diagramish you know not very nice though okay so and they even give us some application notes here in the data sheet which is very useful and then some uh, references that you can read about if this is the first time you've done one or if there's some things you're not sure about all right, guys, here's an example of an eval card. They're kind of showing you the eval card. You can buy it from them. If you, if you know a distributor, you can ask them for it. This is $99 for this card. Not bad at all. And here is a user's guide for that evaluation, the EVM card. Okay, there's... Uh, there's a basic spec, 48 volts to 3.3 at 30 amps, it says down here. So, yeah, good telecom application. This guy's going to operate 250 kilohertz. Some people just want to go real fast, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred kilohertz. But most good designs are, you know, I find are switching more like 200, uh, maybe 300. Or even down just over a hundred. It's a good balance between sizing your parts and switching losses and conduction losses. Okay, so here is a schematic, and it's, you know you kind of have to turn your head sideways to see it. But you got your control chip down here. Your input voltage comes in. You got your main FET. They're they're using this current sense right here, this transformer in the top left T1, same kind of thing the other guys, that's good to do for higher power applications. Then your low side clamp fit down here. All right, and so then scrolling over, you come on the other side transformer, you see your synchronous fats, LC filter, they're actually developing the power off of their inductor to feed back you know, for the bootstrap feedback here. So um, here's the feedback, the voltage feedback come through the opto back to the chip. So there's your main thing, your controller switching devices and your feedback is going to be current sense and voltage feedback. Okay. And they go through a test setup kind of, if you haven't, you know, not sure about how to test something, they kind of walk through that with you and even show a recommended block diagram. Look, you got a fan down here, keep it cool. <laughs> so there you go. Um, you got your load off to your right, your input to the left, your auxiliary power supply down here in the lower right. So more test procedures. So yeah, another example of you know uh, an application so and you can find more 
this is they've got more than one now here's board layout and kind of look at that big ground big power planes ground planes whatever there's some more planes yeah there we go so and then we have parts this this is nice too also to see uh, kind of components they use right so you notice here I want to point something out you see 1812 1206-0805s some people really like to use small parts for some reason they don't really cost anything less and they just cause more trouble to rework and troubleshooting in the lab so I see 10603 here, otherwise 0805s. And that's really been my my thing is I, I like to use 0805s where possible, uh, bigger where you need them and smaller where you need them. But I got to be where I used some pretty busy chips uh, in the past and I went to 0603 just to get, fit them all around the chip. But most often, most of these designs you can use 0805s no problem. Like I say, they don't cost anything more, and they actually save you money in rework and performance. There's a good argument that they're, they're going to perform better, especially when it comes to capacitors. So, but even resistors. So, there's really no need to use small parts. I find a lot of digital engineers like to do that because they have very low power stuff, and they just want those things to disappear on their board. But for us power guys, um, you know... You can other argue also that the more mass you put on the board, the more heat sinking you have. <laughs> you know, that might be a small argument, but anyway, the chips are going to be less affected by temperature when they're larger when, than when they're small. And the penises are going to be better. You're going to have less parasitics with larger parts. So I just like the fact that TI here is using mostly 0805s. All right, guys. So I hope that gave you an idea, kind of comparing different, manufacturers and and looking to see that they actually have boards and they have information about that and like I say uh, you want to find where they have multiple application notes which both these vendors do I just you know for sake of time I just showed you one but just to put it out there to explain that that's that's a very good thing to look for I just want to mention that okay okay guys uh, thanks for watching let me know what you think Two big thumbs up to my patrons. Now, uh, I'm, I'm going to do another video where we actually choose the control chip, okay? Because I might have another chip I want to show you. I'm kind of thinking about it. And uh, anyway, got another video coming up. That was just a quick look-see at chips and kind of what to look for. And how, like, the simplified diagram looks great because it gives you an idea how it works. But yeah, when you see the schematic, you kind of have to... You kind of have to look at each block, especially when you're new to a chip, to kind of see what they're showing you. Because otherwise, you look at the schematic and it's like, wow, you know, they cram a lot in one page a lot of times. So, yeah, I hope you like that video. Let me know what you guys think. Leave the comments below. Uh, really appreciate thumbs up or liking the video. That helps with YouTube analytics. I'm trying to grow the channel, so that really helps. And subscribe uh, a lot of you guys have been around with me for a long time haven't subscribed so appreciate you subscribing too so uh, the other thing is there's patreon link down below let me know what you think about this patreon thing I'm thinking about starting to do um, a weekly communication with the patrons yeah sorry I had to change the battery but I'm thinking about doing a weekly communication with my patrons and also there's a, a membership button and I think I'm gonna activate that uh, as soon as I figure this out. So if you don't want to do the Patreon, you just want to become a member on the YouTube channel, then uh, that'd work too. So just something where we can chat and talk and stuff and, you know, talk about designs, whatever, okay? Uh, ask questions, answer questions. <laughs> so, okay, guys. Uh, oh, and yeah, so there's a Patreon link down below. And, you know, there's links down to buy multivators, so, so on Amazon or, or eBay. Uh, so if you want to, you know, it's a free way to support the channel is use that eBay or Amazon link. I think I got one with Kiwi's and with AliExpress too, I believe. So I don't know if I have any of those links down below, but anyway. All right, guys, thanks for watching and let me know what you think. And we're going to move forward on this active clamp forward converter, but I'm also going to do a video on this one. I'm 
pretty excited about this one. I, I don't even know if I've... I'm not sure if I've even powered that one up. Um, so it's time to do so. Alright guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.